DI. There is rather a lot of anatomy within the orbit. Um, I'm going to handle each bit of anatomy in bits. We'll break it up into smaller chunks. Um, I'm not known for being concise, so that's going to be a good thing. Even if I break it up into chunks, it'll be... Anyway, um, let's not go off on a tangent. Um, the ophthalmologists love to tell me there is more anatomy per cubic centimetre within the orbit than anywhere else in the body, which sounds right. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the movements of the eyeball. So we're going to look at the extraocular muscles. We have two things we really need to consider. The, the angle at which the muscles are running within the orbit uh, and the space of the orbit in relation to where we're actually looking. You'll see what I mean when we get there. And we need to consider the three axes about which the eyeball can move. And then we need to link up the muscles and where they attach. And then it starts to make sense. I'd like to consider why do we move our eyes? We'll come back to that at the end. Why do we move our eyes? Okay, so how are we going to do this? I have got only two models today. I have the simplest model of the eye that I have. We're going to look at the orbit itself and the shape of the orbit. I have another video about the bones of the orbit. Um, and we're going to look at each of the individual muscles. There are six extraocular muscles within the orbit. There are actually seven because levator palpebrae superioris gets included as an extraocular muscle, but I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm just going to talk about the six muscles that move the eyeball. We'll look at the muscles. We'll look at how they're arranged. That's the easy bit. It's pretty easy to see what each one does in isolation, theoretically. But what we need to consider are the three axes that the eyeball sits within and how those muscles cross those axes and how they pull the eye in different directions. And while we might look at each muscle in turn, we need to think of them in pairs because when they work in pairs, they do something else. Rarely in the body do muscles work in isolation. And every time we make a movement, we're using lots of muscles um, to make that movement. It's exactly the same in the eyeball, but we take it all for granted. When we've done all that, we can consider why are the described movements of the eyeball by each muscle different to the way in which we look at the muscles when we test them doing a clinical exam of the eye or of the cranial nerves of the eye. First things first, um, you're aware that your pupils are looking in roughly parallel directions, right? They're, they're side by side, okay, you get convergence and what have you as you look at closely. But essentially, your pupils are looking in this direction. They're both looking along those axes, right? They're parallel. But, well... Right, sorry, it's a plastic skull. When we look inside the orbit, so if you imagine that the apex of the orbit is at the back. Um, the orbit is actually a, a, a flaring shape. It's like a pyramid in there, right? It's, it's narrow at the back. That's where everything comes in from the brain, from the cranial cavity. And then it flares outwards and as it gets wider, there's room for muscles and the eyeball and stuff. So at the apex, at the widest part, that's where you've got the eyeball. Um, but if you, if you stick your finger in there and you go from the apex, out through the middle of the, the opening of the orbit, you see that the orbits, the two orbits aren't pointing in that direction, they're pointing in two different divergent directions. My point is that while the, the neutral position of the eye has the pupil looking in that direction, the actual bony cavity is running in this direction, which means that all of the extraocular muscles that are going to move the eye are also running in this direction because they're next to the, the bony walls of the orbit. Do you see? Now the eyeball itself is suspended in place by a whole bunch of ligaments and what have you so that it can, it can, it can rotate. Um, that's a mid-sagittal section, right? So that's, and the eye, the, the eye is looking that way, right? But when we look at the orbit, you see the, 
the direction the muscles running in. It's running in like it's like this. It's running like that. So the the centre of the the axis of the orbit is actually out in this direction, which we consider the eyes to be in this direction. There's the eyeball. You can see it kind of sticks out from the orbit a little bit. You might have noticed your eyeballs stick out a little bit. Um, they're surrounded by loads of protective things and so on and so on. We can talk about other structures within the orbit another day. We're focused on these guys, these muscles. Now these muscles are long and straight. So four of them are rectus muscles and they're amazingly sensibly named. So the rectus is a, it's a straight muscle and we have the lateral rectus, laterally. We have the medial rectus in here medially, we have the superior rectus up here, superiorly, and we have the inferior rectus doing the same thing under there, inferiorly. How terribly sensible. Um, so those are the four straightforward ones. And then we have two obliques. And what's happening with the oblique muscles is, um, if I take off superior rectus, you can see here is the superior oblique muscle. Now the superior oblique muscle is running from the back here. All of these rectus muscles and the superior oblique run from this common tendinous ring back here, deep within the orbit. They run anteriorly from there, so that's an anchor. So the, the superior oblique muscle runs along the bony edge of the orbit. Um, and then when we get out here, so here, there is a pulley, the trochlea. And we talked about this when we were talking about supra and infratrochlear nerves, uh, when we were talking about the trigeminal nerve and sensory bits of the face. Now, the, the reason the pulley is here is because the superior oblique muscle passes through the trochlea and changes direction. And then what it does is it runs laterally across to insert into the eyeball, but also it runs from anterior to posterior. Um, which is interesting, right? So anterior to posterior and also uh, medial to lateral. So that's the superior oblique. We have down here, we have the, the inferior oblique muscle. Um, and the inferior oblique muscle is just a short muscle running across here from medial to lateral. It's curving around with the eye. It doesn't have the long belly running all the way down here. It's just this bit here. So we have uh, superior and inferior rectus muscles, medial and lateral rectus muscles, the superior oblique and inferior oblique muscles. Those are our six that are going to move the eyeball. Um, now, as I said, the eyeball moves around three axes. Um, we have one axis here, which might be the horizontal axis. And the eyeball will move like this with the horizontal axis. You look up and down. And then we have a vertical axis. So the eyeball could pivot left and right, so you look medially and laterally about the vertical axis. But then there's also an anteroposterior axis running in this direction. So not where the pupil is, not the direction the pupil is running in, but along the axis that the, of the bony orbit. And that means that the, the eyeball can also rotate. So we can, we can give these movements a number of names and they might be similar to other parts of the body. So if we, if we consider the pupil, if you move, move the pupil Who's doing this eye, right? If you move the, oh, this is going to get really tiring. If you move the, move the pupil laterally, that would be abduction. You're abducting your gaze, you're abducting the eyeball. Um, whereas if you bring the pupil medially, you're adducting the gaze, just as if we were talking about a limb where we have adduction and abduction, right? Um, and then we have, um, we might call raising the pupil to look up, elevation. And we might call uh, lowering the pupil to look down, depression. And then we have, if we move the eyeball, so if we're considering the right eyeball and we move it this way, so that the, the top moves medially, that would become um, medial rotation or intorsion. And then if we move the eyeball the other way, rotated that way, that would be lateral rotation or extorsion. Now we're going to talk about why we um, move the eye later, once you've hopefully figured it out. But the other, most of these muscles, I think it, you can, you can see what they do, like lateral rectus, if it pulls on the eyeball, it's going to pull it that way, it's going to abduct gaze, right? Uh, and we'll go into that in more detail in a moment. But if I'm talking about intorsion and extorsion, why do we need to rotate our eyeball? Well, um, one reason is that um, we keep the horizon level 
And as we rotate our head, because I think most of the time, you know, your eyes, your eyeballs aren't perfectly level. You're often tilted one way or the other. So the ability to rotate your eyeball a little way means you can keep the horizon level as you tilt your head. You get to a certain point, it doesn't work anymore and the horizon tilts, right, or breaks down. Um, but that's one reason for intorsion and extortion of the eyeball. The other reason is that um, when we use one muscle to pull on the eye, because of the way the muscle attaches and uh, the way the muscle runs and attaches, it might also not just cause the eyeball to to say elevate, but also to rotate. So then we have another muscle that can rotate the eyeball to counter that rotation so that it doesn't rotate. And in fact, you just look up instead of looking up and rotating and getting double vision. It gets complicated quickly, but that's the principle. Um, we can rotate our eyeballs so we can keep the horizon level as we tilt our heads, but also to counteract the actions of other muscles. Um, right, should we crack on through these bad boys then? Let's look at medial rectus and lateral rectus first because they're probably the most straightforward. So here's, this is lateral, so here's lateral rectus here running from the um, common tendinous ring, lateral to the eyeball, and it's staying out against the bony edge of the orbit and it runs out here. Now look, if we consider the equator, one equator of the eyeball here, so halfway along the equator of the eyeball, it's, it's passing beyond that equator, so it's going to the other side of the eyeball. It, I think it's pretty straightforward what it does. When this muscle contracts, it pulls on the eye and causes it to rotate in that way. So lateral rectus causes abduction of the eyeball. Um, medial rectus on the other side, very difficult to see but the principle is the same. There's medial rectus there. It's doing the same thing. It's following the bony edge of the orbit on the other side. And when that, con that contracts, again, it crosses that equator of the eyeball. So it pulls it that way. So medial rectus causes the angle of gaze or causes the eyeball to be adducted. So we look towards the nose. So when you're crossing your eyes, you're using your two medial rectus muscles. And those two are good. That's it for those guys, really. Um, now, if we look at superior rectus and inferior rectus, superior rectus runs from the common tendinous ring through along the roof of the orbit, and then again it inserts into the eye, it crosses over that equator, and it inserts into the eye. So when it contracts, it's gonna pull the eye that away. So superior rectus will cause elevation of the eyeball. So we look up, that's superior rectus. Inferior rectus then on the other side, which again is very difficult to see, but it's down, it's down in there. Again, it's running along the floor of the orbit. When inferior rectus contracts, it's again crossing the equator of the orbit. So it, it pulls the, the bottom of the eyeball around. So inferior rectus causes us to look down, causes depression, okay? But there's more. If we look at superior rectus, inferior rectus is, is mirroring it. The superior rectus is, if we consider the eyes looking this way, but the orbit is pointing that way, uh, and the muscle is running with the direction of the bony orbit, the superior rectus muscle is passing from medial to lateral. So it's, it's not just crossing this equator, but it's also crossing this equator. What this means is that because it's running from medial to lateral, if superior rectus and inferior rectus both contract, they can pull the eyeball that away. So they can also adduct the eyeball if they work together. This, this vertical axis is what we're pivoting around for adduction and abduction. And there's more. Remember, so we've talked about two axes. We've talked about the, the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. Don't forget that anteroposterior axis. Because these muscles also run superior and inferior to that anteroposterior axis, and they, they cross over, when they contract, they can also cause rotation of the eyeball. So again, because they're superior, so the superior rectus muscle then can also cause intorsion of the eye, and the inferior rectus muscle can cause extorsion of the eye. 
I mean, this is what people often come across uh, when they talk about the primary, secondary, and maybe tertiary movements of different muscles. Um, but there you go, that's superior rectus and inferior rectus. So I've saved superior oblique and inferior oblique muscles. Now, the superior oblique muscle, because it crosses from medially to laterally, it's, I think it's, it's fairly obvious main action is to cause intorsion so the eye rotates this way rotates medially because it yeah it's 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 running over the top there pulls the eye over that way and then the inferior oblique muscle because it's running in the opposite direction there when that contracts it's gonna it's gonna pull the eye that way so we'll get extorsion or lateral rotation of the eye so superior oblique and inferior oblique also work against each other now I also said that these oblique muscles run from anterior to posterior. Can you see, look. So the important thing is that it's this, this angle here is that the, the, the muscle is, is running across this axis um, and it's going, it's, going so it's going across to the other side of, of this axis, right? And it's running from anterior to posterior. What that means is when, when superior oblique and inferior oblique contract, they're going to pull this part of the orbit this away, all right? which means that they're going to pull the eye outward. So superior oblique and inferior oblique working together can also cause abduction of the eyeball. Oh, my poor eyeballs. And there's yet more. One last thing though, really, with these guys. Because the superior oblique muscle is running from anterior to posterior, it means it's also gonna pull the posterior part of the eyeball anteriorly. So superior oblique can also help with depression, can also help with pulling the eyeball down, so you look down. And the inferior oblique, likewise, because it's crossing in a similar direction but in reverse, can also cause elevation. Can, can elevate the gaze you look up. So superior oblique causes intorsion, inferior oblique causes extorsion. When they work together, they cause abduction. So you look outwards, um, but they, the, the superior oblique will also pull the eyeball down a little bit, so it will cause depression, and inferior oblique will also pull the back of the eyeball up a bit, so that'll cause um, elevation. Really, really tricky. Um, but it's just like muscles anywhere else in the body. When you make a fist, you are using a lot of muscles to make that fist. Some of these muscles are contracting, so that you flex the fingers, right? But other muscles have got to relax to let you flex the fingers. If your finger extensors were also contracting, then your fingers wouldn't move. But more importantly than that, we have other muscles going to the wrist that the, the extensors of the wrist stop the wrist from flexing, which the finger flexors are, are wont to do, and that sort of thing, right? So whenever we make a movement, we're actually using a lot of muscles to make that movement, and it's the same in the eye. We make these incredibly precise, incredibly accurate movements, and generally speaking, these muscles are working together to cause those movements. So, so we might think that uh, a muscle has a primary action, but just like everywhere else in the body, you need to remember that these movements overlap and uh, um, they work together. The important, the, the important thing and the hardest concept is, are those axes there. The, the, the idea that the, the, the orbit is angled outwards, whereas our pupils and the eyeballs are looking parallel forwards and that the muscles are running with the orbit uh, and they cross over these equators to move the eyeball. When you add all that together and build it up, then you can start to understand why the different muscles have the different actions. If, if you're studying medicine or another um, health profession and you, you, you studied the cranial nerve exam, uh, you might wonder why the movements I've just described are completely different to the, the H shape that you get patients to follow when you're testing the cranial nerves innervating these muscles. And we'll do the cranial nerves another time, we've, we've done enough. Um, and the reason is because, as I've just described, the actions of these muscles overlap with the other muscles. So. Um, 
you can't just, I mean, it'd be quite hard to, to ask somebody to rotate their eyeball, right, to see if superior and inferior oblique are working. What you need to do is you need to get the eye into a position where that muscle is isolated, and when we're looking medially, the only muscle that then can then cause us to look up to elevate the gaze is bleak. So what we're doing when we're getting the patient to follow this H shape is we're isolating each muscle as best we, ca we can and then asking the patient to perform a movement that only that muscle can perform and making it do it on its own. If we start from the primary position of the eye and we move, we we do all these movements, we're using multiple, mu multiple muscles together. So of course, right, we, we ask, we say to the patient, you know, we, we, you ask the patient to look laterally and we say that we're testing lateral rectus, we're testing the abducens nerve. But I've just said that um, superior oblique and inferior oblique muscles, they can also cause abduction of the eye. So how is that a, a, a useful test? Well, really, lateral rectus is the only muscle that can fully abduct the eye. Superior oblique and inferior oblique will do it a little way but not the same way and of course what you're always doing is you're, you're looking at both eyes and you're asking the patient if they get any double vision and if they get to the point where you know the eyes aren't staying together and one's moving further than the other then they start to get double vision and you can start to work out what's going on in the patient. We'll do cranial nerves another time, we'll add that on, all right? So I asked you why do we need to move our eyes, not just we, not just us, um, but other animals. Why do animals move our eyes? Have you thought of a good reason? You may well know this. Um, the main reason seems to be that you're probably well aware that the retina um, detects light, but there's an area of the retina which has greater sensitivity. There's a higher density of cones there. So that's where we can see in the highest resolution. Everything out here is kind of a bit blurry, right? And the brain fills it in and so on. That's perception. Well, the reason we move our eyes is so that as we are moving or as the thing we're following is moving, maybe prey, or maybe we are the prey and we're being chased, um, or we're just running. And the reason we move our eyes is so that we can keep the thing we're interested in focused on the fovea, on the, the high res part of the retina as we're moving, as our heads are moving, um, or as it's moving. That's why, look, see, look, here's my GoPro. Right, now if I, um, you know, if I do that, if I, if I move my GoPro around like that, as I'm, so I'm moving my head, it's probably actually not too jerky, but we get, we get this sort of action, right? We get a bit of jerky video. But if I stick my GoPro in my gimbal, and the job of the gimbal is to kind of mimic what the extraocular muscles do. And as I move my head, the gimbal keeps everything steady. So that seems to be the main purpose for all these extraocular muscles and the reason why we can move our eyes. So we can focus the high res part of our retina on the thing we're interested in as we're moving. Okay, and that's it. That's my explanation. I just used two models. It's quite good going for me. Um, this is going to take some work. If you've got it just like that, you're doing well. This is going to take some looking at and studying and thinking about, and then you'll get it. I've just, I've just laid you a bit of groundwork. I've tried to make a couple of explanations. But you're going to have to think about this and ideally look at models and, and that sort of thing. Um, but hey, you're just going to boil it down to whatever you need to know anyway and uh, forget the details. And <laughs> Right, okay. Um, if this was useful, I've done well. I've kind of been putting off the eye because there's so much here. Um, but maybe we'll do some more. Well, we will do some more eye stuff in the future. I'm not, not sure when. Catch you guys next time.